My grace is sufficient for thee. Words taken from today's epistle. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Most of you know how much I enjoy the traditional English names for the various seasons of the church here. And the present season bears one of my favorites. We are in the period known as Shrovetide, from the Old English word for confession. Although the term applies most strictly to the three days leading up to Ash Wednesday, its use extends to all these days since Septuagesima Sunday, which have been celebrated in the same violet which we shall wear for Lent. We owe the structure of this season especially to St. Gregory the Great, which is why we find his sermons at the office of Matins for each of these three Sundays before Lent. This holy 6th century pontiff and illustrious father and doctor of the Church, who codified the sacred Roman liturgy which we celebrate to this very day, wished to impress upon his flock the need to make these three weeks a time for true conversion of heart, so that they might arrive at the first day of Lent already in the spirit of penance. And so the Church now presents to us and demands our fearful, fearful reverence before the unfathomable mystery of our salvation. All Catholics must profess these three truths. God is all-knowing and all-powerful, and nothing escapes his will. God is all-loving and truly desires the salvation of every man. Yet man is truly free. He can, and often does, reject God. After the mysteries of the Blessed Trinity and the Incarnation, God's most intimate life within himself and his life among men, there is no mystery of our faith more awe-inspiring, no truth that should bring us more promptly to our knees than the mystery of grace and predestination. All attempts to explain away this mystery have resulted in the most frightening heresies. One extreme insists on the sovereignty of human freedom to the point that man becomes the author of his own salvation, having innately within him the capacity to choose heaven or hell without any aid of divine grace. It is as though God could be surprised by man's choices, as though the Creator should have to reckon with the total independence of his creature. Such a God remains a loving Father, but he is no longer almighty. The other extreme defends God's power to the point of reducing man's freedom to a mere illusion. God has decreed from all eternity who shall be saved and who shall be damned. The damned go to hell because they are deprived of all help, while the elect are overtaken by a grace which they are powerless to resist. God did, Christ did not waste his effort dying for all. He died only for these chosen few, so that God's will can never be said to be thwarted. This God of the Calvinists and the Jansenists is indeed all-powerful, but he is no loving father. Finally, we have in our day the subtle seduction of modernism, which assures us that we needn't concern ourselves too much with this question at all. Eternal damnation, they say, is, after all, nothing more than a theoretical possibility, one which a loving God will not, in fact, allow to become a reality. Aside from the devils, perhaps, hell is probably empty. How can we, dear faithful, avoid these mortal errors and find words to express the truth of our faith. We turn first to the inspired word. The doctor of the Gentiles declares God would have all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. We know that God wills the salvation of all. 
Yet we know that many men are not saved, for hell is not empty. God, in desiring the salvation of every man, does not alter his immutable will that man should be what he is created to be, a rational being with free will. How then does God accomplish his will while preserving the true liberty of his creatures? This is the doctrine which I wish to consider for some moments today, the consoling yet sobering doctrine of sufficient grace. What do we find the sower doing in today's parable? He casts his seed in all places, by the wayside, on the rock, among the thorns, and on good soil. What sort of sower would cast his seed in this strange fashion? A sower who loves every corner of his land, such that no part of that land could ever protest that it was unloved, that it did not receive the seed necessary for growth. Christ died for all men, even though he is known from all eternity in which souls the grace of his redemption would bear fruit and in which souls it would lie buried. In the last gospel of every Mass, we read, He was the true light which enlighteneth every man that cometh into the world. Christ has brought light even to those who he foreknew would prefer the darkness. He created their liberty, and it does not catch him unawares. But he will not destroy what he created in order to save it. Sufficient grace is a supernatural gift of God, like all grace, which renders a man capable of turning himself toward his supernatural end, disposing, but not forcing, him to do to good and salutary acts. This actual grace is given to all men, whether you are an unbeliever who has never embraced the faith, a believer who is at this moment mired in mortal sin, or a faithful Catholic striving to persevere in the devout life until death. We see then that sufficient grace is different from sanctifying grace, that grace which cleanses us of sin and by which God himself dwells in our souls. It differs as well in a mysterious way from effective grace, that actual grace by which Almighty God in the inscrutable and infallible decree of his holy will brings to a holy end those men who freely cooperate with the graces given to them throughout their lives. Before describing the fruitful soil, our Savior's parable th speaks of three other places where his seed may fall, the wayside, the rock, and the thorns. The divine sower sees where he is casting his seed, for he knows from all eternity the actions of all men. Yet man is truly free in the face of these three obstacles, free to vanquish or succumb to his three enemies, the devil, the flesh, and the world. Our Savior himself tells us that the wayside signifies the devil. That is, those whose seed falls by the wayside are those who hearken to the voice of the evil one, a real enemy who truly labors at every moment for our perdition, but whom God never allows to tempt us beyond our ability to resist. Some seed falls upon the rock, which signifies the temptations of the flesh, here the word is received with joy, our Lord says, but soon withers because it has no roots. The spirit is indeed willing, but the flesh is weak. 
The seed falling among the rocks signifies those who have at least some sort of first conversion, but then succumb either to the soft temptations of fleshly delights or abandon their faith in the face of trial and persecution. Other seed, he tells us, falls among thorns. This seed, by all means, does sprout up, but then is choked by the cares and enticements of the world. Finally, though, there is seed which falls upon good soil, where, he says, fruit will be born in patience. Seed that falls upon the good soil is not seed that will be immune to all forms of trial and temptation. Indeed, we hear in another parable that even on the good ground, an enemy will plant weeds among the wheat. The seed that falls on the good ground signifies those long-suffering souls who God from all eternity has known will, despite repeated assaults of their threefold enemy, emerge victorious in the spiritual combat. From the beginning of their life, he planted within them the seed of sufficient grace, and they freely chose to cooperate with it. I described the doctrine of sufficient grace as both consoling and sobering. It is consoling in that it reminds us that we worship a loving God who truly desires our eternal happiness. However late the hour, we all receive at least one invitation to work in that vineyard which we heard about last Sunday. None of us earned the grace of that first invitation, nor can any of us earn the grace of persevering in our labors until the final hour. But between that first and final moment, God has given each of us the dignity of a worker. Through prayer and fervent reception of the sacraments, through penance and works of mercy, we can earn our pay and merit our crown so that our Lord will say at the end in all truth, well done, good and faithful servant. Such is the consolation afforded by this doctrine. But this doctrine is sobering in that we see that we have no promise of infinite grace, only what is sufficient for us to work out our salvation in fear and trembling. Thus we appreciate the full force of the words first given us by the fathers. God promises mercy today. He does not promise repentance tomorrow. Why should we make a good confession right now during Shrovetide? Is it only because we don't know whether we'll get hit by a car before the first week of Lent? No. The real question is, will we be sorry next week? If we spurn the grace of repentance which God is offering us today, how can we possibly presume that grace will be waiting for us tomorrow? It is not enough for any of us to say, surely I will go to heaven, because all it takes to go to heaven is simply not to want to go to hell. Damnation is indeed man's work, but salvation is God's work. Without his grace, we can do nothing. We are all here today to confess before God our utter weakness. Without him, we cannot possibly withstand the wiles of the devil, which we hear on the wayside, the frailty of our flesh, which makes us crumble before trials and melt before temptation, and the thorns of this world, which fill us with a thousand worries over money, honors, reputation. His grace is sufficient for us. He alone is the words of eternal life. That word has been sown in each of us. And if we persevere in grace, it will bear in patience the fruit of salvation. Amen.